Our guest today, as I'm sure you've heard me say many times before, and I'm going to say it again, is a dear friend of mine. And alhamdulillah, I have many dear friends uh, who has agreed to come and share his very, very interesting story with us today. This brother's name, some of you may even be aware of him, his name is Kumail Tanku. Is it Tanku? Have I pronounced it properly? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi Thank you very, very much <coughs> for joining us. Now, your story is quite unique. Um, and obviously, we are going to, you're going to share this story with us. And can we, as we normally do on this show, start from the beginning? Because alhamdulillah, you are of quite a tender age as it is. <laughs> so we have to go back to the very beginning, almost when you're a, a baby, as it were, and maybe try and build up a bit of a profile for those of our viewers who aren't aware of who you are. Mm. Um, very briefly, I am originally from Cameroon, um, a country in Central Africa. I uh, was born in the capital, the financial capital, Douala, and was raised <coughs> there. And, um, well, just lived there really till the age of um, about, say, 16. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, have a few brothers and sisters, uh, African family, seven in total. Seven? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And, um, yeah, that's it, really. Mm. And you're actually, you were actually born as a Muslim? Yeah. Um, well, the tribe I'm coming from are originally from Nigeria. Okay. So, about four generations um, backwards, we, or my grand, 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 my great, great grandfathers are Nigerian. Then they migrated to Cameroon. And then they settled there. And I feel betrayed. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, originally I was born. Do you know what the name of that tribe is, just out of curiosity? Um, not really. Okay, all right, maybe you could find out and let me know yeah, later. Yeah, it'll be the homework. <laughs> okay, so, you, so, the, so you're saying that the tribe, your ancestors or your forefathers came to Cameroon from Nigeria. Um, and um, that tribe, uh, were they pretty much always Muslims? Yeah. Okay. Majority, yeah. Muslims. Okay. So you were, as, as, as we said, mm -hmm. born as a, a Muslim. And obviously, as I said, you're, you're, you're still, mashallah, quite, quite young now. So how, how much of a recollection do you have of your childhood? And obviously you grew up as a Muslim, uh, you know, and, and what type of influence did, did the Dean of Islam have on your life at your in, you know in those formative years. Mm, well, it, it was very very good and useful in its, in its own way. As in in Africa, generally speaking, when you're Muslim, there is nothing too exceptional. It's more of a, okay, I fast in Ramadan and I go to Friday mosques prayers. And I, you know, have happy occasion, extra extra holidays. I eat, uh, I did Eid al Adha and, and the other eat, and that's that's it really. Praying, uh, yeah, praying too, and um, obviously the well known um, madrasas or Arabic schools. So, um, what, what, uh, what my family was living in the <coughs> in the rather Muslim um, area. So neighbors, most of them were Muslim, although there was there were Christian friends. Um, Alhamdulillah, I, I think I, I should I should thank Allah, and I, I think I did have a good childhood. Um, my my father was quite strict in learning the Quran, so I was very much uh, going there every week in holidays, morning, afternoon, and uh, night time. Mashallah. And prayer-wise, <coughs> just no one pray, going to the mosque to pray, and very simple. And Ramadan, of course, praying together, Tarawih, <laughs> <laughs> quite tiring, but yeah, Alhamdulillah, very good child, childhood, um, Muslim community. But didn't didn't know quite a lot in within the religion. As in, I didn't know anything deep. That history, or, for example. Yeah, not nothing of such. Mm -hmm. It's more of go to the prayer. Uh, go to the mosque, um, pray, say salam to the imam, and then head back. Um, 
the lectures there, there were some lectures in 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 Hausa which is the language spoken okay um but there were also students traveling going to Egypt for example and they were quite advanced in Arabic Arabic and they, they they might be having some um they might have had some um, private Arabic lessons but for the average Muslim living in Cameroon or in Douala in particular, there was nothing, nothing special. Would you, because obviously uh, being from Nigeria, we, we, we're neighbours. In fact, you're actually my, yeah. <laughs> finding out you're actually my, my countryman. Um, <laughs> with regards to the level of practice of Islam, um, as you would find in many uh, Muslim countries, not specific to Africa, but mm -hmm. you have maybe a few, a very small percentage are very devoted to the deen. Others who are Muslim and, as you say, maybe fast during the month of Ramadan, maybe even pray, but their lifestyle, you, you know, if you didn't see them praying or fasting, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were Muslim. And then you have others who you don't actually know they're Muslim until Ramadan comes around and then they come out. And obviously others who don't even observe the fast. This is my experience in Nigeria. Is this the same in Cameroon? Yeah, it is the same. Um, it is the same. Um, with, with, with regards to eating, because of the fact that um, <coughs> um, all the um, animals, such as beef and sheep, were slaughtered by Muslims, Muslims. so we didn't have any Problems. any problem of finding halal food. But yeah, unfortunately, yeah, um, a few of my neighbors, for example, weren't praying, couldn't see them, or they were going clubbing at night, things like that. But when Ramadan comes, they observe Ramadan. And you had, again, the, the devotee one very much um, reading the Quran and always at the mosque. And the average middle class, let's say, Muslim who are sometimes in the mosque and sometimes not in the mosque. And yeah, I think it's quite the same in your country. Yes, <laughs> yes. And as we said, not just this is not specific to Africa, obviously. Yeah. Um, you, you tend to find this um, worldwide, unfortunately. Yeah. Inshallah, as time goes on, we pray that the yeah. level of ibadah of the whole ummah will improve, inshallah. inshallah. Um, what were your... At what age do you, do you believe you became a Muslim? Now, that might... <laughs> you're looking at me a bit funny. I, what I mean by this is... Obviously, you were born a Muslim. You were sent to the mosque. Alhamdulillah, you were able to recite the Quran in in the in the proper pronunciations and so on and so forth. But there must have come a time in your life where Islam, you, know, you accepted Islam for yourself, not because you were worried about is my dad going to beat me if I don't go to the mosque or whatever may have been the repercussions. Um, I think it only happened when I came across uh, Shiism, really. Because before that, I can easily recall I was just, let's say, normal Muslim. Well, what, what, what was called normal in, in my country. And no one was asked to have a good research in Islam. Um, there weren't many scholars as in, in my country, back home, scholars are known as being people who could speak Arabic and mm. could read Quran. Read Quran. <laughs> and, and, uh, Same in Nigeria. Yes, and most of the time they don't know much about, about Islam, so they found themselves in a few situations where they couldn't really answer, answer questions, you know. So, but when, when I found out about um, Shiism, it it made me want to research and understand why is there a different school, different ideology. Because uh, till the age of 14, I thought, well, there's only one Islam and one community around the world. People living in Syria, Saudi Arabia, or Africa, or God knows where, they're all Muslim in one you know, following one, one school of thought until I found out, no, it wasn't the case. So, you know, it's, um, it, yeah. it, pushed, it pushed me really to, 
to learn and I think that that's how I started to learn the basic the basics understanding what is required to become just a Muslim and what is required to be called maybe a sheikh or a believer or what is required to belong to such and such school of thought. Mm, alhamdulillah. Um, uh, we thank Allah because the situation with regards to what you were saying about you know the not having a lot of shuyukh has uh, changed quite a lot. <clears throat> I'm not sure about Cameroon, but mm -hmm. definitely other countries in West Africa, not just Nigeria, if you go to Ivory Coast, Senegal, Sierra Leone. If you go to Syria, for example, you see more Amamin yeah. <laughs> from, 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 uh, from Africa. From Africa really so the situation is changing and they're obviously raising the level of yeah. uh, people's understanding of Islam back home. So long may that continue. But how did this happen? What, how were you introduced to the concept of Shiism in the first place? Was this off your own back or was this down to somebody else? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't on my own. <laughs> I've seen... It's nothing to do with me directly, even though I accepted to become Shia without being forced. Uh, rather, it was through my, my father. Um, very, very briefly, because I, really, I don't know the, the full detail, but briefly, um, he, his colleague at work is, uh, is from the Khoja community. Okay. And uh, he was sent to Cameroon to do some work for a couple of years. And my dad is, um, he, he can actually be very much um, uh, looking into things. So Inquisitive. Yeah, very inquisitive, yeah, that's the word, thanks. Um, he, he used to do quite a few things, but some other few things were very much peculiar to him and he didn't quite understand why so he started reading alhamdulillah he 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 was going um every year to umrah so i guess him going there um, opened his eyes because he could see people from different countries and probably he started um inquiring from within um about different things so then they started discussing with um with his colleague and um, slowly, slowly, um, discussion after discussions after discussions, he decided to, you know, make the big, big step and to become a Shia. And the, the, the very good thing about him, and you know, I really, really, really did and still do appreciate that, is the fact that when he became, he didn't force it upon us at okay. all. He, I think, we could feel that he got better to a certain extent compared to the normal average African dad. The way he was behaving, he was, he was more um, the, theological. Instead of asking us to do things, for example, just because he was the father, he, he, he took a different approach. I guess it's, a, it's due to the fact that he had to research and his research pushed him to use his brain a lot. So. You know, he just spoke to us very vaguely about it, um, and he had he planned to open a library just across our house. So really? all the books were coming <coughs> to our house first, and we had to label them. And you know, I was quite young. Books, and books about the school about, of yeah, Ahlul Bayt, yes, yes, the school small book list okay. of children book about the imams, for example. Yes, yes. and I can still recall one of these. Uh, very little book about uh, Imam Ali and the Prophet, um, because obviously back then we only the, know the Prophet and Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Imam Ali vaguely, not really, but yeah. As the fourth khulafa yeah. of the khulafa yeah. Rashidun. Yeah. And getting these book coming, being sent home, I didn't really like reading, but maybe probably the the color and the fact that these are different things, and I was just flicking through the books and. Um, yeah, so then slowly he started explaining to us, I think the, the family, my, my mom and my brothers and sisters, explaining to us very slowly. Um, he was very patient and we, we didn't really realize when we made the big step because he was very, very slow. When he made the big step or when you no, made No, when we made the big <coughs> step. For him it was very clear, clear cut. But for us it was, um, I think... We kept on doing certain things. 
following the Sunni school of thought. But gradually he was telling her, okay, you shouldn't be doing that because of this, that and that. And oh, okay, it makes more sense. Then come back. I remember the very, the very, a very good example of um, Salat, for example. Um, you know, when you join, the way um, we join prayer in the Shia school of thought is completely different from the Sunni of school of thought. And for me, it was so obvious that I was, I was really um, bemused and very proud and, you know, thinking that must be the, the religion. And I started. Well, what more. was his explanation? Because obviously <laughs> you must have been looking <laughs> thinking, what is he doing here? It, it was very, very basic. I seen because when I don't, I don't, well, I'm sure you, you, you're aware of the way things are, are going when, when you join prayer, you have to follow everything completely, sit down with them and, and one day she's having to get up and do the, the one. But um, from the Sunni point of view, uh, the way it, would ex it was explained, you had to, if, if you join in the, on the second rakat, instead of doing the shahud with the, everyone else, you had to stand halfway. Yes. As in, it was clear cut that at the end of the salat, you would have two rakats, for example, and then you have your tashahud. Yes. And then carry on, rather than having one rakat, tashahud, fall over the two if you pray in Dora Aswaisha, and then carry on and add another one after that. So, yeah. It made logical sense, basically, very, in, yeah. in, 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 in a nutshell. Mm. What about, um, I don't know, a very stereotypical thing, but the first time you saw your dad praying on the Torah for example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, I was thinking, why was he prayed on that? And especially, he, he had a few in his room. But I didn't really... It I, is. Didn't, no, I didn't find it too strange. Okay. But probably because he explained to me. I'm sure he explained to him, but I, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't recall that. Sure. He explained to him to me, and yeah, I, I took it quite well, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. Um, I don't know, how, how is the situation in Cameroon? I mean, we have Wahhabi influences in Nigeria. Mm. However, my theory about Nigeria, because as I was telling you off air, that we have five million plus years now, alhamdulillah, post-1979. Yeah. So, inshallah, Revolution. you'll catch up with us yeah. soon. <laughs> Hopefully. Inshallah. <laughs> Taking um, our time. But one of my theories is that because of the Sufi heritage in West Africa, you know, this concept of love for the Prophet and love for his family was there. And so Shiism tends to be easier for them. Also, if you haven't been influenced by the Wahhabis, most Africans, are they don't know that much about Islam. Uh, so when you come and tell them about Imam Ali, they've got no problem with it. They haven't been fed with negativity about the Shias for so many years or centuries mm -hmm. or whatever. Is this how you would... But how is the situation in Cameroon? No, not really. It's it's a bit opposite to oh, Nigeria. That's a shame. Um, it, it's a great shame. I can <coughs> easily recall people in my mosque, for example, local mosque, because Alhamdulillah, in, in Africa, we have mosques uh, everywhere. Every yeah. street corner, yes. So I remember every prayer they used to stay and read some dhikr. So that's more of a Sufi, Sufi, Sufi than yeah, way. Yeah. But I also remember that there was a few, there was, there was a few Wahhabi Imams. Really? Yeah. And... When my when when my dad spoke to us about Shiism, he then moved um, a step further by inviting all these imams from the local mosques. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit crazy. I can imagine what happened after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, there there was about I think ten to fifteen, maybe ten to twenty people gathered at home. Um, funnily enough, it, it was just like um, with the prophet. As in, they were invited, then they had food and they discussed. We, we couldn't get into the room because it was more of all the people and, you know, respected Imam. So we, could, we didn't know what happened. I didn't know what happened. Just like we had to cook at home, I had mom cooking for them and, and then. But in, in the end, unfortunately, you can easily tell it's because of the, 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 the Wahhabi school of thought. They, they, they kept on being stubborn. Um, you know, even, even with the Turba example, for, ex for, for example, for instance, um, them, pray, them, them seeing us praying on Turbas, it, it was more of a, we start worshipping Turbas kind of things. They didn't really, they couldn't really think logically. 
and they, they were propagandas in all the mosques in against your family uh, against the family but also against the, the the new religion coming and be careful don't go there don't speak to so and so because of this could happen to you and you know and and it was completely because there were mosques all around the house so we could even hear them in the morning talking because about they have the loudspeakers out of course. everywhere loudspeakers yes, yes. yeah so you know <sighs> we, we had to go through that it was very difficult but Hamlet was he was very strong my dad was quite strong and he that the, the the mosque was open just across that house and the Shia mosque yeah Shia mosque yeah um and so it, it, was, it was quite fast actually because as we were introduced, I, I think I was about 14, so when I reached 15, there was a mosque already. Um, it, it was a small house um, sure. owned by my dad, so he just converted it, really. Okay. And he got some books from a few countries, I think Iran or Syria. So it was, it, it was at the same time a mosque and a library uh, for people willing to, to have a look. And because the majority of them, um, well, obviously most of them are Sunni, most of the books were um, Sahih Bukhari, Muslim, and all these references. And uh, we, we were lucky to have um, a sheikh coming, uh, who came from uh, Iran to help us and in understanding the, the, the basics of, of religion. Yeah, but other, other than that, yes, there is um, a great Wahhabi impact influence. And that's unfortunate because, just like you said, the average Muslim, they don't know anything. So if you tell them things, um, with proof, they will accept it. Of course, unless they they they, they were being brainwashed, brainwashed by some scholars. Mm. Yeah, unfortunate. Um, what did I want to ask? I wanted to ask you about uh, your f family. But before I ask about the family, I want to know the efforts that your father um, made. Did they have any impact on the surrounding area? Because I'm assuming that in your vicinity, your father was the first person to convert. After his conversion and him opening a mosque opposite on the opposite side of the road and having these books, did this have a positive impact with some, with a few who hadn't had the or hadn't been brainwashed? Um, which, which kind of impact? Do you I mean, did, did basically did people in the area convert to Shiism? Some. Or not really? Mm, not at the beginning, because it was, it was a sort of word of, word of mouth, uh, don't go there, and you know, it, it was so o o open and obvious, you couldn't go inside without being seen by others, so no one really uh, could go inside at the beginning. So the um, only person using it was your family, I guess? It was mainly our family, and... Um, from time to time, uh, the the Khoja brother come in because he was he was a bit further from 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 our area, and um, but slowly slowly um, those capable of reading Arabic because there's a few in my country, um, in my city, because they could read Arabic and it was easier to speak to them than speaking to the average people because then. You know, they had all the books and all the references, so they started coming one by one. Um, and there, there, there were a few curious people too, willing to know what's that new religion we're hearing about. <laughs> new were, religion? Yeah. Sounds <laughs> funny. <laughs> it, it was very... I seen Hamla was young, but I, I can easily remember these things. And Alhamla was also young, so I didn't take it too seriously. Yeah, so they, they came in, quite a few came in. But slowly, slowly... Um, people started getting getting there with confidence. Oh, and alhamdulillah, my, my dad was quite. He's he's very simple, so he's an easy going. So alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah, when we come back, because we're going to go for, to break now. When we come back, we can talk about uh, the the effect that your father's conversion had on the rest of the family as mm -hmm. well, and then obviously your experiences thereafter. Please don't go away. Join us after this short break. We'll continue with this uh, interesting discussion of the uh, life so far of Brother Kumail Tanko. Assalamu alaikum.